of you will be familiar with as as we've we've hosted him on on several occasions um so so tuvia is a, a celebrated and very renowned um israeli tour guide um, and he's also an author of of several books and his his latest book which i i just want to mention um which i personally can't wait to get my hands on is is called for the sake of zion a curriculum of israel studies um Maybe two of you, you can hold it up. Um, so, so for those of you who might want to purchase the book, you can do so via the via the publisher's website, which is based in Jerusalem. It's called korenpub.com. That's K-O-R-E-N-P-U-B.com. And um, I'll put all the details of this in a follow-up email tomorrow so that you have it all in black and white. Um, um, so, so tonight, yes, we're talking all about um, the celebrated and, and very renowned British Zionist Ord Wingate. Now, I just want, before I hand over to, to Yael and, and Dr. Tuvia, I just want to give you my a, a personal story about um, a Wingate connection. And it's, 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 it's a very spurious connection. But when I was 10, my parents emigrated from, from the UK to South Africa. And we settled in Pretoria, which at, in, in the 80s, when I was 10, um, it had a very thriving and very close-knit Jewish community. And bef many years before, in 1947, um, when the Jews first started sort of settling in, in the Pretoria area, um, because country clubs were, were still, you know, uh, unsurprisingly closed to, to the Jewish population, they started off, uh, they, they created a Jewish country club in Pretoria in the most beautiful valley setting, and they called it the Wingate Park Country Club. And when we were kids there in the 80s, we used to spend almost every Sunday there playing tennis and swimming whilst my, whilst my parents used to play lawn bowls at the, at the Wingate Park Country Club. And then when I was of bar mitzvah age, my, my bar mitzvah simcha was held there. And it was, it was named after, after General Ord Wingate. So, so that's my very spurious connection to to the subject of, of this evening's webinar. So without further ado, I shall stop boring you all with my spiel and I shall hand over to um, Yael. So thank you very much, enjoy. Um, all I would ask ladies and gentlemen is that you keep your microphones muted, um, but we're, we're keeping your video on so that you can get a feeling of, of community, you can see other people that you might know, etc. So without further ado, I shall pass on to Yael. Thanks Yael. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Do you know, I've been really looking forward um, to, to tonight's talk, I, I think from, uh, mainly for two reasons. The first reason is because it's only recently that I've started being interested in, in Wingate himself. And growing up in Israel, I, like um, most Israelis, would have heard of the Institute for uh, Physical Edu Education and Sports in, uh, up in Netanya in Israel. Um, and so most of my life, I, first of all, I thought we we're talking about Wingate. Most Israelis would say, who? Oh, you mean Wingate. That's number one. And number two, I always thought he was a keen sportsman. And, and that's what I, you know, it took me best of, I don't know, 30 years to realize that there was more to him, although he was keen on, on fitness. But the second reason, and um, I, I found it, I was nearly, I've been nearly overwhelmed in the last few days um, receiving so many comments and so much communication from people after we publicized today's talk about their um, excitement and their enthusiasm and their links, both direct and indirect links to, um, to Wingate himself or to his family. Um, up to an hour ago when, when my friend Mark phoned me and told me that his grandfather was a chindit and, and fought uh, with them. Um, with Wingate in, in Burma. Um, but perhaps very, very uh, special email was um, a few days ago from, from um, Daniel Burke, who I believe is here today, who, whose book about his grandfather, who fought alongside Wingate in the Burmese jungle, uh, is due to be published in, um, in October. Um, and, and Daniel's grandfather uh, was a soldier who went missing. Um, Fortunately, he did. He did. Um, he was um, saved, but he went missing during the war. And his mother, who is Daniel's great grandmother, wrote to Wingate and received the most compassionate, compassionate letter that I believe we can see here. This is quite incredible um, letter that Wingate himself wrote to the mother of the missing soldier, offering personal support um, to her and and to the family. 
And, and so Daniel's, um, Daniel Burke's um, book, uh, which is called Captured Behind Japanese Lines, uh, you wow. know, would tell, would tell the story. Um, but it's been, it's been incredible. One of my students, father, uh, a father of one of my students went to Palestine because he was inspired by Wingate. Someone else knew his mother, someone else knew uh, his wife. There's a whole, you know, and just like you said, Steve, there's a whole lot of uh, places in Israel and abroad, including in London, that, um, that are monuments, monuments to him. Um, Wingate died very early on, and um, Churchill, in fact, said, and I'm going to quote, he, he wrote to his wife saying, I had recognized him as a man of genius, and I hoped he might become a man of destiny, which he didn't because he died very early, but he had a lot of uh, very keen followers, but a lot of people who didn't like him. Uh, and Wingate seems to have had so many contradictory um, elements, aspects to his personality. But Zionism was an uncompromising trait of his personality. He was an avid Zionist. And I think my first question to you, Tuvia, would be why? I mean, the guy was, uh, you know, he was uh, brought up by, uh, um, very religious uh, parents. In, in, in fact, um, they, they were members of the uh, Plymouth Brethren. Um, he went to Palestine at the time when a lot of British officers were not, um, were not Zionist at all. In fact, there was quite an anti-Zionist sentiment at the time. Would you be able to talk a little bit about his background, his upbringing, and a possible link to what happened to him later on in life when he became slightly less religious, but more and more keen on Zionism? Absolutely. Good evening, everybody, from uh, Chile, Modin in Israel. Um, Wingate himself, as Yael correctly pointed out, should have fitted in the British Army mold. After all, he wasn't a member of the tribe. He was Christian. Um, he also was educated as, uh, uh, in all the proper places. He went to a proper public school, to a, uh, he went to Sandhurst, was a British army officer. And on top of that, he studied Arabic and spoke it fluently in the Oriental School of Studies in London. If that wasn't enough. He'd also spent time in the 1930s before being seconded to the British mandate to Palestine in the Sudan, where he got to really, uh, sharpen up his Arabic. So you'd think he would just fit the picture. And yet uh, the famous American poet, Robert Frost talked about the path less chosen. And uh, everybody, almost everyone, the default setting when you were in the British mandate of Palestine was to be more the pro-Arabs. And one of the reasons why is because the British empire needed something with three letters, O-I-L. Uh, and the Arabs had a lot of that, the Jews didn't. And um, also on top of that, the, it was just natural, uh, the British um, aristocratic and upper class mentality, a lot of these uh, officers had been through Sandhurst and been through the system and had the old school tie and the regimental tie. And it was just natural for them to uh, favor the Arabs. So anything about his upbringing, it doesn't point out to the, I would like to, in a sense, fanatical Zionist that a woman gave became. And one of the reasons that made that switch is when he actually got to Israel. Until then, by the way, he hadn't really come in contact with anyone who was Jewish besides the figures in the Bible he was raised on. Now, Yael mentioned that he was raised in a very strict uh, uh, upbringing by his... Uh, he was born in actually the British, uh, in the Raj. He was born in India and uh, then raised later on in Scotland, um, in England. And his parents literally thumped the Bible into the children. And when I say the Bible, they're talking more about what the Christians refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, and he was basically raised on it along with his mother's milk. So from a very young age, he had a deep familiarity with the Bible. And when he came to Israel, he was amazed to actually see the places that he'd read about in the Bible in three dimensions. On top of that, as he arrived in, his, in the land of Israel, I should say, the British Mandate to Palestine in 1936, there was what's now known as the Great Arab Uprising. And Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was 
leader of the Muslim Arab community, uh, who, as we all know, spent the wars against Hitler in Berlin, he fomented a huge revolt, not just against the Jews, but also against the British uh, military as well. So Wingate was tasked as an intelligence officer with trying to see what exactly was going on. He spent a few months just touring around uh, Israel, especially the northern part where the Arab infiltrations were going on, meeting the pioneers from the kibbutzim, especially a kibbutz called En Harod, and believe it or not, and this is going to blow all of your minds, teaching himself passable Hebrew, because he wanted to read the, book, the words of the Lord in the original language, not after they've been translated into Greek and then into Latin and then into German and then into King James English, then to modern English. He wanted to go all the way back to the original Hebrew, so he actually taught himself quite good Hebrew uh, in those few months. He also learned about the Zionist enterprise, met the young pioneers, and was absolutely blown away. And with the zeal of a new convert, embraced the Zionist cause with a passion. Yeah, yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah you, you have answered my question. And I, and I would like to a little bit uh, later on come back to this, um, to, to him and, and his Bible, in fact. But I can't, I can't help to if you go straight to the thing that I found most um, interesting and maybe lower the level a little bit. The guy had um, quite unusual habits. He was uh, very, very eccentric, to say the least. I mean, he was known to give his military briefings stark naked and, um, you know, thought nothing about it. Nobody else would make any comment. He was a high up uh, office, obviously. Um, he would have onions hanging from a from a like a, a string around his neck and he would munch on raw onions all day long. He took his Bible wherever he went. Um, oh, yes, he had an alarm clock that he would uh, attach to his wrist that would sometimes ring, but sometimes not, you know, kind of randomly. Um, you know, he did all these things, which are very, very unusual, obviously. Um, I'd like to hear, we all know what a fantastic officer, is, an amazing strategic uh, strategist um, um, he was. But what kind of a man do we, he was, what, what do we know about him? What's the gossip in other words? Oh, very, very juicy gossip. Now, you can tell Yael has been in England for a long time because he's a great expert at the British understatement when she called him interesting. When English people say he's quite interesting, that means he's unbelievably fascinating. And also, when people are, when people don't have so much uh, good upbringing, they say they're a bit mad. But when they're, they have this good upbringing, they call them eccentric. So uh, Wingate was eccentric in the extreme. Uh, because he was homeschooled uh, till he went to this public school, he didn't really have such social mannerisms. Uh, and even though he was an outstanding athlete in school, despite his small stature, um, one of the things that the boys decided to do was to haze him in school. And the basic, the hazing involved, this is a British public school that is worst. The hazing involved basically uh, being stripped naked and running the gauntlet as about people throwing things at you in water and everything. And usually people were used to being a, a whimpering wreck. Wingate basically stood there in his birthday suit. This is when he was still in high school age and ran the gauntlet. Uh, here's a picture I drew of Wingate um, and ran the gauntlet. And then when he finished it, he didn't say a sound. He sat, he stood there and stared everybody down. And this has never happened before. And no one knew what to do about it. They just let him be afterwards. And I think that was his first um, uh, public performance uh, without any clothes on. And it became a feature. It was a totally normal thing. You can imagine this spit and polished British army. This guy would literally walk up and down the lines wearing nothing except for occasionally a string of onions around his neck or his alarm clock on his wrist. Absolutely but naked. And uh, everyone had to keep a straight face or else they would be punished. And sometimes high ranking officers would come to his tent or to his room to consult with him. And he just kind of forgot to put his clothes on. So most people think that's extremely eccentric and it is. Um, and he had all sorts of uh, ideas when we talk about the chindits, about physical fitness and about uh, basically how one should comport oneself. But eccentric is the word. The other thing, and we're going to see a brief video clip over here in the land of Israel, is when he got to Israel for his initial tour, he was, he, he, as you mentioned, he would walk around, not just on me for show and tell. Everywhere he went, he would have the good book in his pocket, right? That's not me, but the Bible. Um, and he 
he would just take out at random moments when people least expected it, a well-marked Bible. So the story goes, and we're about to see the video, when he first came to the north of Israel, he was sitting there with his British army officer's uniform, very starched and prim and proper, and he was being taken around by one of the uh, kibbutz members in the north with their blue work stalk and their hair, their hairy chest and their sunburned arms. Um, and he, they were just admiring the view. They were sitting in the north of Israel in a place called the Giboa Mountain, very famous mountain in the Bible. Um, and we are about to see now what happened next. You can see behind me, that's me with the Liverpool hat on. Behind me is the Giboa Mountain in the background. And this is what happened next. It was the year 1936 and there was a strange sight in the hills right behind me, the Gaboa Hills, there was the sight of a British army officer, a captain with a starched shirt and his British officer's cap. And sitting by him was an Israeli kibbutznik with a beautiful dark tan from working the fields, a blue work shirt. And they were just sitting next to each other, these two disparate looking individuals staring at the scene, the beautiful valley underneath them, the Valley of Israel. And suddenly, the British army officer jumped up in a Scottish accent and shouted out, I did, I can, why didn't he not do it, me? And which basically means, I don't know why he didn't do it. And the Israeli guy looked at him and said, who, who are you talking about? He said, Saul, why didn't Saul do it? And the Israeli kibbutz said, Saul, who, what are you talking about? And the British army officer looked at the Israeli Jew in shock and this Presbyterian Scottish Christian took out a Bible from his pocket, opened it up into the book of Samuel, and he read the following sentence. And he basically translated it, because he read it in Hebrew, believe it or not, Saul put himself in disguise and went with two servants and they went to find the woman. What he was referring to, of course, is the event that happened in this very, very place. The night before Saul's death, the top of this mountain, right behind me, the Gibor Mountain, surrounded by the Philistine troops at the bottom, Saul took some of his servants and in disguise, they snuck through enemy lines and went to the hills over there, the hills of Endor. And there he went to find a source was to conjure up the ghost of Samuel, Shmuel, and asked him what his fate would be. It's a strange incident. And yet, what interested Wingate was the military aspect of it. He said there he was the night before the battle, and he snuck through enemy lines in disguise. What should he have done? He should have turned around and attacked them from behind and take them by surprise. He had a small mobile unit who'd gone through the enemy lines and now in a spot where the enemy couldn't see them. And the kibbutz looked at Wingate in shock. And he realized that for him, this wasn't just black words on a white page, but rather he could see it. He could see it in three dimensions. It was if he was there 3,000 years ago. He could see the Philistines at the bottom of the hill. He could see the hills of Endor. And his strategic mind was basically figuring out what can we learn from this. So for this Christian Zionist, the Bible for him was a real live reading book. And he applied its lessons to his own way of thinking. And he set up from that moment something called the Special Night Squad or Plugot Alayla, which he trained Jews using the Bible as inspiration into small mobile squads to take the war to the enemy. And this, my friends, became the foundation of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. And Wingate's last words he wrote to his wife before he was killed tragically in World War II um, was, May I forget Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. And so here we are decades later, Wingate's name is still venerated in this country. He's known as Hayadid or the friend. And he taught us that the Bible is not just an ancient document, but a living, breathing document. And when we come to Israel, the whole Bible gets a third dimension. We can see exactly where things happen. This, my friend, is where Saul was. This is where King David was. This is the land of our ancestors, the land of our people, and the land of our future. So 
Maria, I find it quite astonishing, really, to think that such a brilliant military uh, man, um, such a strategist, actually, you know, was literally inspired by, by the Bible. He was literally inspired by Gideon, uh, who was, uh, you know, one of, one of his heroes. One of the reasons why he chose Kibbutz En Harod for his uh, base, if you like, was not just because it was strategically positioned, but also because it was the area where, where Gideon fought. Uh, so it is, it is, you know, it is an unusual combination, uh, but, um mm -hmm. his his teachings and his training did influence the uh um the the military thinking of of what would become the israeli army and in fact moshe dayan said he actually said we know everything everything we know is because of wingate so he gave him full credit for the uh you know what would have been the base of the military thinking of of the israeli army later on do you want to say just you just mentioned the uh, the special night squads? Do you want to just say a few sentences about about them? What was so unusual about his his initiative there? Okay, well, first of all, I actually have on me um, the exact quote in my book that Moshe Dayan uh, said about Wingate. What he actually said was the following, and I quote: um, "Judged by ordinary standards, which would not be regarded as normal." By his own standards, but his own standards were far from ordinary. He was a military genius and a wonderful man. So clearly there's a big love fest going on between the Jews he was training and Wingate himself. So yes, the Bible for him was his military textbook, literally this Bible over here. And the reason he was so inspired by Gidon or Gideon in, in English, uh, to such an extent that even after when he served in Ethiopia, he called his squad the Gideon unit. He was very much inspired by Gideon. And it's a feature that Plymouth Brethren and many of these uh, uh, Protestant um, small uh, factions to be, to have the Old Testament as their guidebook. Uh, and they really take it uh, quite literally and seriously. And Gideon, as we know, the famous story is he took a very small mobile unit and attacked the enemy at surprise at night. And that's exactly what the feature was of the uh, Wingate's philosophy. In fact, the kibbutz he based it on in Harod is literally about a few minutes away from the Harod Spring, Mayan Harod, where the whole story of Gideon took place. And he would do that, by the way, before he would give his military briefing, he would take out his Bible and read the relevant sentence from the Bible and then give the modern military briefing. And it wasn't just Jews in these units, by the way, Yale and everyone here. It also had uh, British volunteers who uh, in the regular British army were also in the special night squads as well. And the idea was to take what the Bible said, rather than wait to be attacked. He didn't believe as uh, the Sermon on the Mount is about telling the other chief. He believed if someone rises up to kill you, as the Old Testament says, you should rise up first and get to them before they get to you. That's what his philosophy was. Uh, and it, the idea was very simple. It was rather than wait and being attacked and defending yourself, which is what the Jewish power military group, the Haganah, was doing. Haganah means defense. And their policy was called Aflaga, which means restraint. They'd wait to be attacked, and then they would respond. He said, no, that's not the way you do it. What you do is you don't wait to be attacked. You go into the enemy first and launch preemptive strikes. Sounds familiar? Six-day war? So basically, that's what he did. He took a small mobile squad of Jewish and Christian British volunteers from the British army, and they would go at night uh, to the bases of the terrorists who were crossing over the border to blow up the oil installations and other British military targets. So they would catch them on the way to the terror attacks, and they would launch the attack when they were least expecting it. That's what the special night squads were, small mobile night squads. And as anyone knows, that really became the, um, the way of fighting of the IDF as well. Uh, preemptive strikes as a six-day war, special night squads attacking the enemy from behind, as a lot of the Israeli elite units use Wingate basically as their blueprint of how to be an effective fighting force. Okay, well, but Wingate, um, I suppose he was very openly uh, pro-Zionist, that, that didn't go down too well, and maybe not surprisingly nope. so, uh, and he was, uh, he was summoned back to London um, he was actually told that his time in Palestine was to, to end um, and, and, and he had to go back to London and went elsewhere, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, 
what I want to know is, do you do we know how he reacted to it? Do we know whether he kept in touch with the uh, Jewish population in Palestine even after he left? Do we know how he responded to the so yeah. sort of punishment? He was extremely upset, obviously. I mean, he'd just been given England's second highest award of bravery for his services in the Special Night Squad, the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, which he was later was to receive an astonishing two more times. He's the only British officer I know of who was awarded the DSO and bar three times, which is a quite an incredible achievement. The only higher medal than that is the Victoria Cross. Uh, which for various reasons within the British high establishment was denied him. But he got just got the DSO, who's wounded in battle against Arab infiltrators, and he went back to England to recuperate. When he was in England, those who were against him in the hierarchy of the British army conspired to keep him from returning to Israel, because by this time, he was almost like an embarrassment to them, his very pro-Zionist sympathies. And they, a stamp was put on his passport, that the bear of this passport is not allowed to return. Um, to the British mandate to Palestine. So he went for a few weeks for r and and ended up getting stuck in England. Now in England at that time, there was also a guy called Charles, later Chaim Weizmann, uh, a very profoundly important Zionist who actually arranged to have the, uh, the Balfour Declaration written and later became Israel's first president. And Chaim Weizmann joined the Zionist Salon, uh, with, sorry, Wingate joined the Zionist Salon in London with um, with Chaim Weizmann and all these other leading Zionists, including Moshe Sharet, who would later be the uh, second Prime Minister of Israel. And he also corresponded with his friends in Israel, to, uh, the land of Israel, to such an extent that later on, when he was sent to Ethiopia, which we'll talk about briefly, he asked for his, uh, his Batman, his personal aide, to be a Jew from the land of Israel who had fought with him in the Zionist schools. He had this very relationship with. Um, with the Jews both in the British mandate of Palestine and the Zionist community in London. And he dreamed one day of returning uh, to the land of Israel as a general in the new Jewish army. So he didn't cut his connections. In fact, they grew stronger over the years. Okay, let's talk briefly about his time um, in Ethiopia and in Burma. Um, as we mentioned Daniel Burke's book uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, whose grandfather was, was Jewish and, and uh, a, a yeshiva boy, in fact, uh, who, who fought with, um, with Wingate in Burma. Uh, and you mentioned, Tuvia, that he actually uh, named his forces in Ethiopia after, after uh, Gideon's forces. Do you want to tell us a little bit about his achievements in, in those countries? Okay, they were quite remarkable. We'll do this shortly, even though each one deserves a book in it or a movie in itself. So he was stuck in London, and when the war started, um, he was trying to get back to Israel. They just would not let him. Uh, he was just put in some meaningless job in coastal artillery until eventually uh, the British realized in the period of the phony war, the, the first part of World War II, that this is wasted, wasted military talent. Now, he had serious connections, Wingate serious connections we'll hear about soon but amongst them was his cousin called sir reginald wingate uh, who was the former governor of the sudan and one of the issues when the war started is italy had invaded what they called abyssinia today we call it ethiopia uh 1936 mussolini invaded it and the british were at war and they thought we need to start already getting some of this territory back so Wingate was charged, he was sent to the Sudan, and he was sent charged basically with trying to regain Ethiopia from the Italian army. He had a very, very small force, a uh, kind of a few hundred and a few hundred and um, uh, irregulars who joined. And he called it the Gideon Force. And there are remarkable stories of uh, night attacks against superior Italian forces. But the most remarkable story, without doubt, one of the most remarkable stories in World War II is how he managed with less than a thousand soldiers to get an Italian army 15 times its size to surrender without a shot being fired. What he did basically is he just called their bluff big time. He, um, he went to the uh, general, uh, all dressed up in his dress uniform, said, you should just know, old boy, I'm the leader of a massive British force of tens of thousands of soldiers who are behind me. We're just the reconnaissance unit at the front. And if you don't surrender your soldiers and arms to me right now, you are going to be wiped out, you're going to be annihilated. And somehow he kept a straight face. 
and the Italian army's general fell for it, and his troops, and after 15,000, 15,000 Italian troops surrendered and had stacked up all of their arms, uh, they turned around and realized that the entire British forces in Ethiopia was just Wingate's ragtag bunch of, uh, of uh, a few hundred British soldiers and a few Ethiopians, but the deed had been done. He was given his second DSO for this, his second Distinguished Service Order, but he probably deserved the Victoria Cross for that one because he saved not only his own men's lives, but those 15,000 Italian men as well. And then he was basically marched uh, into uh, the capital of Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa, and he was with Haile Selassie, the formerly deposed emperor with the British are now returning to the throne. Um, and Haile Selassie had a white horse ready for him. He didn't want to ride it because he was scared of the horse. So he would end up going up in a car and Wingate went in first on a white horse to newly liberated Addis Ababa with his Jewish aide-de-camp next to him, uh, Akiba. Uh, and that should have been the highlight of an amazing career. Up next is incredible. He was sent back to Cairo to wait for further orders and they weren't forthcoming. He was basically, after that incredible success, was just abandoned. Yeah, El, next question. Okay, uh, unless you wanted to show a video now um, about Wingate played by an actor, would that be the right time to? That could be a good idea. Okay, so Steve is going to show a video now. There's an organization in Jerusalem called the Friends of Zion Museum. It's founded by um, by evangelical Christians, and it basically supports the Christian Zionist connection to the land of Israel and focuses on many Christian Zionists who really helped make Israel what it is today. And um, they have an actor reenacting a short clip on Wingate's career in the land of Israel before it's kicked out. So let's pause now and see the man himself in his own words. Major Old Wingate, British intelligence. They say I was something of a rebel in the British Army. In 36, I was posted to Palestine, the British mandate. Back in 1917, the original plan was to help the Jews build their own land. At least that's what a lot of people thought. Jewish pioneers were coming from everywhere and settling with farms and orchards and towns on the land of their biblical ancestors. It was just like the Bible said the children of Abraham were coming home. Marvellous, simply marvellous. At first, we encouraged the idea of all this, even helped it along. But the government was using their best endeavours to block Jews coming to Palestine, totally on the side of the Arabs who didn't want any Jews there. To make matters worse, every night, local Arabs would band together and raid the Jewish villages, stealing, burning, doing terrible things. I refused to sit by and do nothing. Nothing. I knew the way to end this was for the Jews to take the initiative, take the fight to the Arabs, instead of waiting to be attacked every night. I went to them and told them they had to fight. I mean, really fight. And you will not win unless I teach you how to fight. And I will lead you into battle. I trained them how to be guerrilla fighters, how to take the fight to the enemy instead of waiting for the enemy to fight you. But I did more than teach them. I led them, showing them by my example that good officers lead their men into battle, put themselves out front. Well, we put a stop to those Arab raids, at least for the time being. It... Uh, didn't go so well for me, though, however. The British Army didn't appreciate one of their own acting on his Christian faith and helping the Jews. In 39, they got their way. I was reassigned to London. But then, one of the young men I trained was a real fighter named Moshe Dayan. He went on to become Israel's greatest general. According to Moshe, I told them everything they knew. At Ord Wingate, most often, you'll hear them say, you mean our friend? At the end of the day, that's the best legacy of all for any of us. 
What did you say? So the legacy is the friend. He's still known as Hayadid in, in Israel. Let's talk a little bit about the perhaps legacy or, 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 or what he did in, uh, in Burma, Tuvia. That was, uh, that's something that not many people know about indeed. It's not really taught, I don't think much, but um, a very difficult time. And um, he was very instrumental. Absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, there are people here in the audience who are connected with, uh, with their grandparents who fought. And I believe there's even members of Wingate's family in the audience as well. Uh, however, I would like to say back to Egypt, he was in a major depression. He just literally won Ethiopia back for the Ethiopians because until the Italians conquered it, it was the only African country that had never been colonized in all of Africa. So he won independence back for them and embraced their cause. And he was just left to languish by the British authorities and went into a severe, severe depression. And uh, he had all these ideas about uh, how to fight with his small squads behind enemy lines. And they were falling on blank ears because the British army was very much uh, stuck in an old style way of fighting. As we saw in Singapore, when they lost Singapore very quickly, they had all the guns pointing the wrong way because the Japanese will never be able to come from behind. Uh, and that was a problem with the British. They underestimated the enemy. They had a bit of hubris. Uh, oh, and the Japanese did come from behind in Singapore on bicycles through the jungle. And uh, just as they thought, uh, the Japanese are, are eventually going to fall in uh, India. Uh, before they get to India, we just have to be spit and polished British army. But they didn't really have a strategy how to bring that downfall into operation. Wingate did. He had a fantastic idea, but it fell on a lot of deaf ears of the British brass. And that was to actually not just take people behind enemy lines, but to establish bases deep behind the enemy lines uh, and supply them with airdrops and build these bases, have thousands of soldiers behind enemy lines harassing them, and basically sow confusion amongst the, the vaunted Japanese army as supposed to wait to be attacked. It is all developed from what he did in Israel with the special night squads and I also how he fought in Ethiopia. And nobody was really listening to him in the British army until, until the one man who did need to listen heard about him. And of course that man was Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill of We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches fame. And he heard about this officer and he was intrigued about him. And one of Churchill's aide de camps got him a interview with Wingate. And Wingate went in and basically without any problem at all, he, he, he gave Churchill his entire plan and Churchill was blown away to such an extent that on the spot, Churchill invited Wingate to accompany him to Quebec to meet with uh, Frank and Delano Roosevelt in the famous uh, meeting in World War II uh, between American and British uh, forces in Canada. And Wingate said, but my wife is in Scotland. Churchill was Churchill, no problem for him. He got the British Army to bring his wife from Scotland on a train to the port and she met Wingate on the ship. And he spent the entire time to Canada uh, working on this plan, met a few times with Churchill. Churchill introduced him to the American army generals as well. And it was approved from the highest order whatsoever. So even though the, in the Indian, the British army in India were very much against Wingate, they saw this upstart with his newfangled ideas. They didn't really have much to say when Winston Churchill said he's coming and I'm going to promote him and he's going to do what he has to do. And they also had unlimited funds. And another person who managed to charm on the voyage over was, of course, Mount Batten, who was in charge of the British forces in the Far East as well. And he was also very much charmed by both Wingate and his wife, Lorna. And um, that's how he got to do what he wanted to do in Burma. And his idea was not just to take uh, people from top units, but to take any, he said, any British soldier is capable of uh, becoming a commando if they have to set their mind to it. And he trained them extremely rigorously with force marchers and heavy weapons training and heavy backpacks and how to survive in the jungle and jungle warfare. Today, any special forces in the world, the SAS in Great Britain, the Green Berets, Sayyid Matkal in Israel, the Rekis in South Africa, all these special forces, they just take for granted this is a way to train, but it was Wingate who developed this uh, training and it worked. 
they, he, got, he got his forces into way behind the enemy lines, not once, but twice in Japan. Um, and uh, they harassed the Japanese lines. The Japanese didn't know where the attacks were coming from. And it was a great propaganda victory also for the Allied forces. Until then, just been one defeat after another until this charismatic General Wingate came along and gave them finally the successes that they needed. Uh, and it was just an incredible, um, uh, incredible achievement. And that's why uh, Winston, and in fact, he said, when, and I want to read a quote, another quote here from Wingate. He was writing, after he'd been kicked out of Israel, he was writing to the, uh, the land of Israel. He was writing to one of his, um, to his cousin, Sir Reginald Wingate. And this is what he wrote about A, Zionism, which is fascinating, and B, how he thought about the Jews as fighters as well. This is what he wrote, and I quote, The Jews are loyal to the empire. And by the way, he had Christian and Jewish soldiers fighting in Burma with him. The Jews are loyal to the empire. The Jews are men of their word. They have always been so. The fact is that you have no idea what they have already done in Palestine. You'd be amazed to see the desert blossom like a rose, intensive horticulture everywhere. Such energy, such faith, such ability, inventiveness, as the world has not seen before. I have seen young Jews in the Kibbutzim. I tell you, the Jews will provide soldiery better than ours. We only have to train it, and that and they will achieve what we want them to achieve. So he believed training was the main thing, but almost fortuitously, as a prophet even, he added on a sentence, which is quite chilling to read right now. And this is the sentence he added on. He said, Britain has to advance the foundation of an autonomous, Jewish community. He wrote this when he was in Burma. Uh, it has to advance a foundational autonomous Jewish community with all the means in its power. And he added, for pity's sake, let's do something just and honorable before, it, before the war comes. Let us redeem our promises to the jury and the shame of the devil of Nazis and fascism on our own prejudices. So in other words, he said if Britain honored the Balfour Declaration, there wouldn't be a Holocaust. Unfortunately, Britain did not honor the Balfour Declaration. In fact, they dishonored it with the 1939 White Paper, and there was a Holocaust. And Wingate wrote that if Britain would have honored its promises, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened, which is pretty uh, stirring, shaking, and very prophetic, and indeed tragic. Okay. Um I think it's not really, it's half a question, half an observation. Um, people have mentioned the fact that he was, well, you just said he was charismatic. People mentioned the fact that he was very caring towards his, his soldiers. Um, we've got a couple of uh, firsthand uh, testimonials to, to that, even, even among the people who are listening tonight. He did have a very, very harsh, if not cruel side to him as well, did he not? Um, I mean, I think, you know, he was kind of a man of up and down anyway. Um, but I think he probably didn't want to be at the wrong, wrong side of him, not just towards the people that he perceived as his enemies, but also towards his own men when they didn't quite deliver what he expected of them. Uh, he, the, the kind of things he did wouldn't have passed today. And I know we're talking about a different, a different era, but I think it's worth mentioning, isn't it, that he had Absolutely. that side as well. Yes, I mean, getting on his wrong side, you would find yourself with a swift kick up the rear. Uh, and uh, he did use he did use physical force as well to uh, admonish some of his officers. They took it in the spirit of rough love. Again, that wouldn't be tolerated today. Just as when I went to school in South Africa and we got canes for not doing our homework, that wouldn't be tolerated today either. But we live in a we live in a different era. Uh, so I believe it, it sounds shocking to us today, but back then it was actually people didn't look think twice about it. They just saw it as tough love. But he was definitely, you did not want to get on his wrong side. And amongst the people he most despised uh, were the very knee-jerk reaction pro-Arab uh, British officers in the Mandate of Palestine. And also what he saw as the desk jockey sitting in India as well, which is basically going to the polo clubs and, the, and their, all their, and their, 
you know, spit and polish functions, but not really focusing on the war that needed to be won. So he was very much a man in the field. And as you heard in that brief video clip, he also believed in what the Israeli army believes is leading from the front, not sitting behind saying, okay, boys will be right behind you, about 50 miles behind you. He despised those, those officers. And he was very unshy about it. He wrote some wicked reports, uh, putting down some people who were higher ranked than him. Uh, but then again, he also loved and admired those who followed him. People would literally follow him to the ends of the earth. He was an inspirational leader, albeit with some tough love sometimes. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, questions and comments. So I, I would I would like to ask you one more question. Um, and, and that's an and answer of what if question. Um, he died very young. Um, he died in a in a plane crash. He was actually terrified of, of flights and he did die in, in, a, in a plane crash. Um, not everybody was that sorry at the time because he was a troublemaker. Um, okay. But, you know, we quoted Churchill who said he would have liked him to have been a man of vision and, and, and he wasn't. Uh, at, the at the same time, I'm going to quote from uh, Field Marshal Montgomery who said in 1966, in fact, to Moshe Dayan, that it was the best thing he ever did. Uh, to have died so early because he was a, he, he would have been trouble in other words, but I would like to ask you to via um, what do you think might have happened, I know that. Um, ben Gurion said that he could have well become uh, the first chief of staff for the Israeli army, which is a big thing for Ben Gurion to have said if he hadn't died so early, what do you think might have happened to him and and with regards to 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 Palestine and, and Israel as well. Right. Well, his tragic death was just that. It was a tragedy. In fact, um, he died, as you mentioned, he was fiercely scared of flying. It's ironic that he was killed in a plane crash. Um, what you can see now is a monument to him in, in London, actually, by the Victoria Embankment, with the famous Winston Churchill quote on him. But the next picture we're going to see is where he's buried in Arlington in the United States. He's the only British general who's buried in Arlington. Then if you look at the grave over here, you can see, first of all, an Israeli flag underneath his name. Um, and second of all, on top, there are stones on top of the grave uh, left by Jewish admirers decades later. When I was in Washington, D.C., I made a pilgrimage to the grave and I saw those Jewish youth movements going to the grave and hearing the story about uh, Wingate and leaving stones on the grave. Now, for those of you who know a bit about British military, would be surprised to ask why a British general is buried in the United States. And that's because uh, the majority of people on that plane uh, were actually American military and the American customs to bury them back in, in, in uh, the military cemeteries in the United States. That's why he's buried there, which is probably quite fortunate because he'd be buried in Burma where he fell, which is a British practice, and a lot less people would visit his grave and learn about him. But anyway, um, he was also killed just seven weeks before his only son, Jonathan, was born, or Jonathan. So he never actually lived to see his son, who also became, uh, went to the Royal Artillery in, in, in the British Army and was also an officer as well. Um, and his wife also was young, and it's just a tragedy all around. But what would have happened, I don't even need to guess. You know, there's this famous book called The What Ifs of History. He mentioned numerous times to friends and correspondents and in conversations what he would like to do after World War II is over. And that was to return to the land of Israel and to lead the Jewish forces and be a general in the spirit of Joshua uh, and lead the forces of the Jewish people back to their to their sovereignty, back to independence in their own homeland. And that was without a doubt what he would have done. In fact, just as a postscript before we uh, head on to the questions soon, um, his wife, Orna, actually went to um, Israel in the War of Independence with Wingate's Bible that he carried with him in all of his campaigns. And she wrote an inscription in the front of it, and this is what she wrote. Since Lord Wingate is with you in spirit, though he can no longer lead you in the flesh, I send you the Bible he carried in all of his campaigns from which he drew the inspiration of his victories. Pray be a covenant between you and him in triumph or defeat now and forever. And this Bible is a very emotional inscription. And she settlement named after her husband, Yemin Od, um, is now in a kibbutz, uh, in kibbutz en Harod, uh, in the museum itself. Um, so he was very much, very much 
desperate, I would say, to get back to Israel and to lead those forces. And that's why in one of his last letters he wrote, he wrote of that famous line on top from the book of Psalms, if I forget Jerusalem in my right hand, forget it's coming. So without a shadow of a doubt, I don't even need to guess, I know he would have gone back and been one of the generals and leaders in the IDF. So even though he wasn't um, uh, there physically, uh, his spirit was there, as you can see in his wife's Bible inscription, and very much the way that he taught to fight was inspiration for the IDF. Uh, to this day, how much smaller forces can overcome much larger forces, by uh, very clear and advanced strategic thinking. Okay, we've got just a few uh, minutes left. So let's have a quick look at some, some of the questions, if that's okay. Um, if we start with, in fact, our, our very own um, author, uh, Daniel Burke, who, who, is, who is asking whether, whether we mentioned that already, the fact that his uh, headquarters uh, was in Kibbutz En Haro. Daniel is asking, where, do you feel that Wingate was aware of the biblical connection that this was the place where Gideon uh, chose for his 300 warriors? Yes or no, Tuvia? The answer is, of course, yes. In fact, he took the he took the special night squad on a forced night march to Gideon Spring and read the Bible from there, which I'm sure they're all thrilled about. So he very much knew uh, that's where it was. Yes, it wasn't a coincidence. OK, an observation here from from John Winlow, the Plymouth Brethren and the Open Brethren were both very uh, tuned into the Tanakh including the prophets. Many non-conformist Christian groups are drawn to the Jewish emphasis on family and community. So there's another, another stance on the kind of link between his mm -hmm. upbringing uh, that led him perhaps to, to his affinity to Judaism and, and to um, Zionism as well. Um, someone said, would he have had a Scottish accent? So someone is doubting your amazing uh, acting skills, Tuvia. Uh, he was born in India oh, and he went to a posh school, British school, so maybe he wouldn't have a, a, Scot a strong Scottish dialect, but, uh, <laughs> but, but well done anyway. I didn't care. I think you spoke with a wee bit of Scottish dialect. Okay. <laughs> right. Graham, Graham says that his passport was stamped not to be readmitted to Palestine True. by the British. True. The only password ever signed, ever stamped with that stamp. Pretty unbelievable. Yeah, that's the level of hatred that was against him. Right. And Sorrell says that when Winget left Palestine, he went to visit Chaim Weizmann's mother and left, I guess, either left in tears or left her in tears. I'm not sure uh, which, which is the right one. But you mentioned, you mentioned the fact that they had uh, a yeah, he was very, very He was very, very close to the Weizmann family and was deeply uh, was moved to great emotion when Chaim Weizmann's son, who was a Spitfire pilot, was uh, killed in action in World War II as well. So very, very, very close with the Weizmann then. Okay. There's a, a, a private uh, question, uh, couple of questions here. How much were his activities with the Knight Squads unauthorized by the command? There's a view that key British policy uh, was to stir up enmity between Arabs and Jews so that the British could stay uh, on as the party holding the peace between the two. And we're Is talking about the famous colonial policy, divide and conquer. Yes, British were very good at that. Uh, but um, the truth is he had a, one of his famous backers. He was known, he, the reason he could get away with what he did, he had very influential friends. And General Wavell, who was a famous general in World War II, and he also happened to be out in a the British mandate to Palestine when the Arab uprising took place. And he gave Wingate a open, a carte blanche to do whatever he wanted to suppress the revolt. Even though some of the more traditional officers uh, poo-pooed him, he had General Wavell. And do you know how he got General Wavell's approval? General Wavell came to a staff exercise and Wingate, who was a mere captain then, which is a much lower rank than the general, he literally marched, he flagged down the general's car on the way to the exercise, hopped in the back seat next to the general, and presented his battle plan. And General Wavell was so blown away by the audacity of this young captain, and B, by the actual unbelievable uh, concept that he, he gave it a stamp of approval. Okay. Um, someone else is, uh, same person, in fact, is adding, I'm not sure you'll know that, uh, Tuvia. Is it true that many of the mandate records of that period are still not available for public view? I don't know about that. I know that the British Secrets Act, is they usually release the papers after 50 years. 
So, someone's mentioned, and, I, and I've been told by um, my friend Jonathan, who I believe might be here tonight as well, that the BBC screened a series highlighting the key episodes of Ord Wingate's life. So I think back in the 70s, I don't know if many people here have, have watched it, but apparently it does exist, and it's not available on Amazon. I, I did check. Um, I, don't know about, I don't know about that, but I do know that when we finish the Q&A, uh, Steve is going to put on the last minute before he does his uh, questions, the last film, the actual film clip we have of Wingate, not a made for movie TV, just before he went on his fateful journey to his destiny, uh, a British film crew came and filmed him with Mountbatten inspecting the troops. It's just a one minute clip, but it was filmed moments before he was killed, before he went on the plane and killed. Um, we're going to see an actual clip of Wingate himself. Uh, before Steve does his uh, announcements at the end. So I don't know about the made for movie TV, but the real footage itself, which I actually found on the YouTube, uh, is available for everyone to see. Okay, maybe one one quick last question. Someone says, I'd always thought that his activities were solely with the Haganah, but this week someone in Israel said that he also had connections with the Irgun. Is this true or just rewriting history? Um, no, the Heath connectors were really with the Haganah. The Agun itself uh, was only founded as a breakaway movement called Haganah Bet in 1936 when the revolt started. Uh, and it was very small at the time. Begin only became the commander of the Agun actually in the, 19, in the early 1940s when he came with uh, General Anders' army. Um, and so Wingate, all of Wingate's dealings were with the Haganah. So that is a bit of political, a bit of historical revisionism. Uh, but he was very much connected with leading members of the Haganah and what would later on become the Palmach as well, the uh, strike force, the elite strike force of the Haganah itself. Okay, so we can now watch the, the, the film that is in fact the very last available, available film of Wingate's life, is that right? Steve, are you with us? Yep. Okay. Sound. These are the first newsreel pictures of this great little soldier, the man who trained British troops to live in the jungle and beat the Japanese at their own kind of fighting. No detail was too trivial for the inspection of General Wingett. He knew that in war, trivial details cost lives. The kit of a man who will live and fight for months cut off in the jungle is an all-important factor. General Wingett knew how vital it is to carry the things you need and how vital to leave behind the things you don't. brilliant officer has lost his life in a plane crash, all too soon in a campaign that is crammed with hazards. We mourn his loss, but we know that his teaching will bear fruit in due course. These are the men of the long-range penetration group. Their fighting behind the enemy lines in Burma has made them a name throughout the world. That is the epitaph for Charles Ord Wingate. Okay, so you can see the epitaph of Wingate in this film was about the fighting, but his real epitaph was the state of Israel itself. That's what lived after him. They say in Jewish tradition that uh, what your eternity is, A, your children, a yeladim, two is your masim tovim, your good deeds, and three is what you create. So Wingate actually managed to create an entire ethos. One, he taught us that the Bible is not just white, pages with black words on, but rather it's a living, breathing book. It, it's not a dusty manuscript. It's something we can all learn from today. In fact, many of Israel's so-called secular founders, such as Ben Gurion, who had a regular study group of the Bible every Saturday in his kibbutz house, and Chaim Nachum Bialik, who all grew up from traditional families, they all looked on the Bible as a blueprint or a textbook or a history book of the Jewish people itself. That's one thing he taught us. And another thing he taught us is that you should never say, I'm one person, what can I do? He taught us, if you're one person, you can make a difference. He, he was very convinced in his ideology and he knew it would work. And he, against a lot of opposition, he steadfastly fought to make that difference. And he also taught us that you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. There are many Jews who wouldn't classify themselves as Zionists, 
and there are many ardent Zionists amongst the Christian community that are some of the Jewish people in the state of Israel's best friends. And that's why to this day, his name is still spoken with tremendous reverence and honor and respect when he's referred to as Hayadid, the friend. Thank you very much. I think that's much. all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Duvia. Steve, shall I give okay. you the last? Yeah, thanks, Yael. Thank you, Tuvia, for, for both of you for, for, you know, for helping to provide a fascinating insight into this, um, this very British Zionist, uh, a really fascinating insight. So thank you, both of you, and, and for making it so engaging. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, before you all uh, log off for this evening, just a couple of, of reminders for some upcoming events. Um, next Wednesday during the day, we have, in partnership with Christian Friends of Israel, we have our annual Lobby Day for Israel, the theme of which is um, the UK's support of anti-Israel bias at the UN. So please do look on our website. Um, I'll send you the details tomorrow in my follow-up email to you all. And do please consider joining us for what will be a very interesting and, and engaging day. Our guest speaker is Hillel Neuer from UN Watch. Um, a man that I'm sure all of you who, who have a vested interest in, in Israel and its well-being will be well aware of. So please do consider joining us. Um, and then in the evening on the same day, so that's Wednesday, the 3rd of March, we are hosting another webinar. And this time it is all about Israel's um, navigating Israel's health, healthcare system. So for those of you who might be interested in making Aliyah or who are just interested in, in, in Israel's healthcare system in general and its comparison to, to how our NHS works, um, we have, we have a, a, a former British, um, uh, she's now Israeli, she, she made Aliyah um, almost 22 years ago in 1999, Dr. Tanya Kardash. And she will, um, she will be presenting all about the Israeli healthcare system. She is um, she's a, a medical director for, the, for Maccabi in the Jerusalem and Shefela regions. Um, she is responsible for about 1,500 doctors and um, 600,000 patients. So um, clearly a, a lady with... Um, much, much knowledge and much skill um, in both her, her, her subject and her people management. Um, so please do um, join up, you know, consider joining us for next week. And again, I'll put all of this in, a, in an email to you following up from, from this evening, which you will get um, the latter part of tomorrow. So ladies and gents, on behalf of the, the World Zionist Organization here in the UK and the Zionist Federation, and um, Yael Brewer and Dr. Tuvia Book, thank you very much for joining us. Go safe, be well, and we look forward to welcoming you back in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Keep thank safe. You. Thank, you. thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye, Yael. Thank you very much. Bye, Lita. Thank you so much. It was so interesting. It, it was far, far too short. We <laughs> could have spent another hour or so. Just before saying goodbye and good night, my own uh, brush with Lord Wingate, or to paraphrase, Spike Milligan, how I defeated <laughs> Mussolini and uh, uh, my Rommel in Africa. I, I studied my <clears throat> fun in uh, Ein Harod, in Kibbutz Ein Harod, Meuchad. Uh, I uh, visited, I was very impressed with the museum dedicated to uh, Ord Wingate. Uh, I was very impressed uh, climbing onto Mount Gilboa and being uh, in awe of the great events, the biblical events that took place there and inspired Ord Wingate. Another brush with uh, Ord Wingate, uh, my <clears throat> wife's aunt and uncle at uh, an art gallery were very friendly with his widow, with his son, and kept uh, a, a good relationship, friendship on him many years. I would like to add something. I probably will give you food for thought. Unfortunately, Ord Wingate did not die in a plane crash. 
he was murdered. Uh, that was organized by the British establishment. Uh, it's un unprecedented. I mean, it's not unheard of. Similar troublesome military chiefs were disposed of. General Patton was also disposed of by the nasty people in the American establishment. General Sikorsky, uh, who was the leader of the Free Poles, was also accidentally had an air crash organized by the NKVD or the, the Soviet Secret Service. So uh, Ord Wingate did not die in an air crash. He yeah. may have, uh, he was bumped off. It was the English, the British establishment that found him very inconvenient, nasty. He, he did everything against their ethos. So we, we pay tribute to Ord Wingate. Uh, May his memory be blessed. And we we are in awe of such a, a wonderful person. Dubia, you have, you heard a, have you heard that before? Yes. Yeah. No, uh, but I can't tell you the Prince Diana didn't die in a car crash. Thank you very much. We're going to finish our conversation. Thank you for participating. Stay safe. Take care. Thank, and you. See you in the next, Thank you. Uh, Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.